Good evening, all. Welcome to this session. Before I um, deliver my opening remark, just want to do some housekeeping. We are going to ask you please to mute your, your set. And we will have a Q&A session after Mr. Kelly's presentation. And Dr. Diane Braffick, she will co-host that session. But I just want you to mute your um, mute your sets right now and and welcome. Board of Directors of BARB, Directors of the Barbados Diabetes Foundation, guest presenter, Mr. Tony Kelly, Diabetes Patient Advocate of the UK, Management and Staff of BARB, Management and Staff of the Barbados Diabetes Foundation. Dr. Diane Braffitt, Clinical Director of the Maria Holder Diabetes Center of the Caribbean. Members of BARP and the members of the Diabetes Center, members of the media, friends of BARP, good evening. This evening's event demonstrates the power and reach of partnerships. And we at BARP and the Barbados Diabetes Foundation identified that in order to amplify the message of diabetes and simultaneously heighten the awareness, we need to combine our efforts. From a national perspective, our numbers are of major concern and every effort must be employed to halt the increase of diabetes on our island. A recent report from the World Bank stated that Barbados diabetes prevalence in the population 20 to 20 20 to 79 is 14% up from 12.4 in 2011. Data that is indeed alarming. But the task of digging, going deeper with data, sharing statistics and all that will rest heavily on the shoulders of two capable people, Mr. Tony Kelly, Kelly who Dr. Diane Braffitt will introduce shortly. But let me please introduce to Barbados, Dr. Diane Braffitt. Dr. Diane Braffe is the clinical director at the Maria Holder Diabetes Center. She studied undergraduate medicine at UE, and postgrad postgraduate internal medicine at the Queen. Sorry, she studied undergraduate undergraduate medicine at UE and postgraduate internal medicine at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital. She attained her membership of the Royal College of Physicians in London followed by an MSc in diabetes and an MSc in endocrinology. Diane invests much of her efforts in diabetes care and believes in helping patients to become well-informed and empowered completely capable of preventing or managing NCDs regardless of the age, physical ability or socioeconomic status in her limited spare time. And I want to emphasize that in her limited spare time, dance is her passion. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to introduce this evening, Dr. Diane Brown. Thank you, Marilyn. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Can you hear me, Marilyn? Yes, I'm here. We have some serious technical challenges this evening. So, if anybody thought they were technically challenged, you need to be in my seat this evening. Good afternoon to everybody. Um, thank you very much for having us. Um, thank you for those kind words, Marilyn. And I would say that I am very, I think, heartened and encouraged by the ongoing partnership that we have and how it continues to develop. And I'm glad that um, you know, there's this recognition that um, many members of BARP um, can benefit both from the education and services that we offer. Now, this is a PAP session, so I don't want to talk, spend too much time you know, talking about myself, but I do want you to know that the Diabetes Center is dedicated to what we call multidisciplinary diabetes care, and also managing persons who are at risk of diabetes. So it's not just diabetes, but persons who might be at risk. And I think as we go on in this lecture, we will recognize that a lot of the measures that we say, you know, to use to reduce your risk of diabetes and diabetes are just for really general health, to be honest. Okay, but I don't want to steal Mr. Tony Kelly's thunder, but I don't think I could steal it anyway. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to introduce uh, Mr. Tony Kelly, 
So Mr. Tony Kelly, um, he's British born um, and he was raised in Jamaica and earned, and sorry, and he, sorry, <laughs> He lives in Birmingham uh, with his family since. He was initially a teacher in English and religious education in the Kingston High Schools. And he worked in local and central government for 30 years before early retirement as a middle manager of equity, equality, diversity, and inclusion. Among his qualifications is a socio-legal studies master degree from the University of Birmingham. For nearly eight years, Mr. Kelly was a Diabetes UK community champion, devoting his time educating all communities in Britain and further feel about health and well-being in relationship to diabetes, a hereditary medical condition. He is very proud to have controlled his type 2 diabetes with physical activity and diet since diagnosis 17 years ago and has never taken medication. I wanted to add what impressed me most is that when Mr. Kelly had this diagnosis, um, he just remembered really all the family members that he saw who suffered as a result of diabetes, having blindness, amputation, premature death, et cetera. And he made the firm decision from the get-go that that was not going to be his reality. And I want to encourage all Barbadians, if you have type two diabetes, um, that does not have to be reality, but you have to make certain choices to change your lifestyle. So I'm not going to go on with his bio, which is extremely long. He's done a lot of work in the British population uh, with coronavirus and mobilizing the community of persons with diabetes and NCDs to be vaccinated. But he's also edited children's books related to health, adult books, appears on webinars, and he has won several awards um, over the last few years. He tours both within the UK, but also internationally as well. And we're very pleased to have him here. I welcome him to Barbados. He's come to Barbados volunteering his services, and we are very pleased to have him here. So I'd like you to just um, enjoy and um, take in the message he has to, to bring to you. Thank you very much. For that introduction, Dr. Brathwaite, I'm going to share my screen and hopefully it works. So we're starting the slideshow from the beginning, um, where are we? Slideshow from beginning. Um, I'm always struggling with this. Um, this seems at the top from beginning. Yeah, okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. Is that showing on your screen, Diabetes Awareness Presentation? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, may I first of all thank um, Marilyn Bryce about Bowen, who is the chair stroke president of the Barbados Association of Retired Persons. Um, thanks for having me. And I also have to big up Dr. Dan Braffwitt because for those of you who don't know, Dr. Dan Braffwitt saw me on a webinar, a Zoom, being held here in Barbados about 18 months ago. And she then said, I want you to come to Barbados, please. I was doing it from Britain during the lockdown period. And here I am, my first visit to Barbados. And I'm loving it, especially the beaches, the, the, the super, super beaches you have here. But I'm going to whiz you through. I'm going to speak for about um, 40 minutes and then take question and answers, which, which hopefully we'll manage to get through. So, Tony Kelly, Diabetes Strategic Patient Partner, that is a mouthful. So simply put, I say I am a diabetes ambassador. And my motto or my strap line is our health is our wealth. And I work as a volunteer for the Birmingham and Solihull Integrated Care System of the National Health Service. None of those need to happen, so I move swiftly on. I start with the disclaimer. I, it's a very important that I do the disclaimer. I'm not a diabetic nurse. I'm not a diabetic doctor. I'm not a nutritionist. I'm not a dietitian. I am not a member of the healthcare profession. However, since my diagnosis, 19 years coming this Christmas, I've lived with this medical condition and you will constantly hear me referring to it as a medical condition. I know in the Caribbean and in the States, it is referred to as a non-communicable disease, a chronic disease or an acute disease. Back in Britain, we were told to refer to it as a medical condition. So simply put, it's the same thing. Whenever you hear me use the word medical condition, I'm talking about NCD or 
chronic disease or acute disease, okay? Now that's me as a cheeky little boy. My mother and father took that picture when I was growing up. I was born in London and London is cold. You notice me in either a sweater, a cardigan or a jumper, okay? That's me before they sent me off to the land of their birth, which was Jamaica, a district called Whitehall in the parish of St. Thomas. And uh, I'm going to share with you my knowledge gained over the last 10 and a half years as a uh, given to me uh, being trained by Diabetes UK, okay? What has enabled me to live so long without taking any form of medication, right? I start off by mentioning, before I go on to the cookery, as a child growing up in Whitehall St. Thomas, I noticed relatives of mine, as Dr. Brathwaite mentioned, some had strokes, some were blind, some had heart attacks. Relatives of mine had to go into Kingston on the dialysis machine because a kidney stroke renal failure. Some had lower limb amputations and some also died prematurely in their 50s, 60s, 70s. What we in the Caribbean would say, gone too soon. As a very inquisitive, nosy child, I would ask these relatives of mine, what is the matter with them? All they would say to me is they have a touch of sugar. So they minimized or trivialized or downplayed this very, very serious medical condition in my growing up days in the 60s of referring to it as a touch of sugar. Ladies and gentlemen, diabetes is more than a touch of sugar. It is a very, very serious medical condition. Now, that picture shows me in my apron or pinafore learning to cook. When I was growing up in Whitehall St. Thomas, every time I made a beeline for the kitchen, my grandmother and my grand aunt who was a teacher would say, go take your book, meaning go and study. Boys back in the 60s were never allowed into the kitchen in the home that I grew up with, in. And therefore I could never cook. Not even when I went to university, when I went to um, college, never ever learned to cook. Couldn't even boil an egg. In 2008, my daughter decided this has got to stop because I would get home early from work and my wife, who is a primary school teacher and my daughter, who is an opera singer, they would come home later and they would have to put the pots on the fire and do the cooking. So in 2008 for Christmas, the best Christmas I've ever present I've ever had, my daughter gave me 15 classes at a place back in Birmingham. And believe you me, just ask yourself the question, then answer it. Who do you think is the best cook in the Kelly household now? Okay, I'll leave that with you to think. However, also remember, and I'm not being sexist, some of the best cooks, chefs we're talking, are men. So that in itself tells you something. So I, am, I can cook, I'm competent, I'm a good cook now. And I'm gonna come back to that in a while, okay? I big up the National Health Service. Some of you on this webinar might have been from Barbados and lived in London, lived in England, parts of Britain over the years and are now back retired here. The National Health Service was formed in 1948. The Second World War was from 1939 to 1945 when Hitler and the Germans bombed and destroyed vast areas of London and even Coventry Cathedral, which is in Coventry. There was a well-known slogan, and some of you might remember it, which was done in Asia, Africa, and the Caribbean, your country needs you. So people from the Caribbean, Asia, and Africa came to Britain because we're part of the British Empire, part of the Commonwealth, to help to rebuild Britain. So the first person in the middle, my aunt, Aldith Richards came from Bath, St. Thomas, Jamaica in 1952 to train as a state registered nurse. Followed by my mother on the left, the only black person in that picture came in 1953. But it didn't end there, also to train as a state registered nurse. And then their sister came in 1956, my aunt, Aunt Yvonne, also. So three sisters, and I call them the three degrees. Some of you might remember that pop group. And what I want to say also, some people came as factory workers, some people came as street cleaners, some people came as clippies or bus conductors, some people came as bus drivers and taxi drivers. And I am about changing the narrative. When I see images of the National Health Service of recent times, and they show pure white people and completely airbrush out of it, 
black people, I take great offense to that. So when some people say, why do I have to big up my family? If I don't do it, who is going to do it? And if we want the next generation to know black people came and built up Great Britain and made it what it is, then we need to make sure we, we get that information out there, changing the narrative. So they've contributed, all three as nurses, and then eventually because of their bedside manner and so on, they all migrated to the United States because British trained nurses back then were held in very, very high esteem. You will hear the words hard to reach community. If you go on the internet and look it up, you will see it there, hard to reach communities. And they are referring in Britain to African, Caribbean, Asian, and white working class people. Ladies and gentlemen, I take great exception to the term hard to reach community. It is insensitive, it's offensive, it's patronizing, it's condescending, and can be deemed to be racist. Because what I say when I go to all these big events and so on, and the consultant or the professor or, or whoever is up there talking, I say, excuse me, what are these hard to reach communities? And they mention all of these people, we as black people in, included. I ask them, are they on Mars, Jupiter, Venus, in the rainforest, in the jungle, in the, on the Himalayas, in the deep blue sea? No, they are not. We all make up the community, which leads me to the next slide saying, instead of saying hard to reach community, which is a myth or misnomer, say instead historically excluded, historically neglected, historically ignored, marginalized or underserved. Those are better words and phrases to describe us as black people living in places like Britain, America, and Canada. And my well-known saying is, if Mohammed can't go to the mountain, then the mountain must go to Mohammed. So I do on average, ladies and gentlemen, 150 community events per year by knocking on gurdwaras, synagogues, churches, residential homes, office blocks to get engagements. And, and, and that is how I am so proactively doing this. Um, so as I said, marginalized and underserved, especially those with sight and hearing impairments, especially when I do the ones who are deaf, they bring the signed interpreter. And at the end, they ask so many questions, these deaf people. And I said, why? And they said, because nobody under normal circumstances tends to want to engage with them. So I do that with white working class traveling um, communities are like the gypsies. Um, my motto is prevention is better than cure, which is why I'm on this task, having done this now for the last um, 10 and a half years. I don't go to health clinics, medical centers, and hospitals as a general rule, because the people who go to those venues are already there for a purpose or a reason. So I will seek out the barbershop, the hairdressers, the place where they play their dominoes, the rum bar, where they're playing the cricket, or where they're playing the, um, the football, or, or whatever. I go to places creatively thinking and where I go and involved with people and I have my cards and I have all of these t-shirts with my logo on it. And that's how I get 150 community engagements per year. My journey on this particular diabetes um, awareness started 19 years ago this Christmas. My wife noticed the four T's. They are called T for tired, T for toilet, T for thinner, and T for thirsty. I was displaying tired, toilet, thirsty, thinner. My wife kept saying, something's wrong with you, something's wrong with you. Ladies and gentlemen, 19 years ago, I was getting up three or four times during the night to go to the toilet. If you're in good health, that should not happen. Now, I was like the ostrich. The largest bird on the planet is the ostrich. Proverbially, at the first sign of danger, the ostrich buries its head in the sand, hoping that the problem, the danger will go away. Yes or no, most men, most men are in denial. They're not in touch with their feelings. They're not in touch with their emotions. Most men do not do doctors. I will put my hand up and say, 19 years ago, I was one of those men. So my wife kept nagging me and eventually I thought, no. And she's heard me speak on television, radio all over the place. She says, yes, I was nagging you because nobody's supposed to be getting up four or five times during the night to go to the toilet and losing weight, tired, toilet, thirsty, thinner. So I went with an early morning sample of urine before breakfast and the doctor said, you know, Mr. Kelly, I said, yes. The records show you have not been down to the surgery 
in eight years. Eight years you have not been down to the surgery. I held my head in shame. That's not the case anymore now. She put the dipstick into the urine that I took, which I took before having anything to eat, held it up to the light and it changed color. And she said, Mr. Kelly, Tony, you have glucose or sugar. They are the same thing in your urine. But I'm gonna send off a sample of blood to the lab and it will give, give me the final analysis. And it came back as an early Christmas present this year coming 19 years, as I said, that I have type two diabetes. Now, you heard me say at the beginning, all these relatives of mine who had all of these various things, it runs in my family. So it is hereditary. So it was in a case of when was it going to happen to me? I have two choices to make, ladies and gentlemen. Do I curl up into a ball and die? Or do I make the lifestyle and behavioral changes to keep the complications I alluded to at bay? I chose the latter. And that is why instead of having six, seven, eight tablespoons of rice and peas, which I love, I now have less. Less is more, smaller portion sizes and making sure I'm eating a healthy diet and also healthy balance, well-balanced diet and also doing a lot of physical activity. So moving swiftly on, those are the top 10 countries where diabetes is rampant, starting with China and ending up with Bangladesh. And you will notice of the top 10 countries, five are Asian countries. I'll mention them, China, India, Pakistan, Indonesia, and Bangladesh. Sometimes before I show this, I will ask the audience that I'm with, who, can, who do they think, which country is in the top 10? And a lot of them back in Birmingham or back in Britain where I'm doing it, shout out Jamaica. It's only 3 million people live in Jamaica. Look in the, person, the position in number 10, Bangladesh is 8.4 million. So Jamaica doesn't come anywhere near the top 10, nor does Barbados. However, some people say to me, they have never seen a fat Chinese man or fat Chinese woman. If on this webinar, you have the perception or the idea that is only fat, overweight, obese, or morbidly obese people who can develop diabetes, I want you to get rid of that out of here, please. People who are skinny, and I'll show you a slide in a minute, people who are meager or in the Caribbean would I say maga can also develop this medical condition. So those are the top 10 countries. And of course, we, Jamaica and Barbados and the Caribbean are not in the top 10. That just shows every ethnic group can get this medical condition. The International Diabetes Federation says in 2021, 537 million people had the condition diabetes, the medical condition. By 2030, it is expected to, projected to rise to 643 million. And by 2045, it is going to go up to 783 million. Now, some people said to me when I do this training out there, because it's when I went to an event in Wolverhampton, not far from Birmingham, I spoke about my condition in an audience to 300 people and Diabetes UK, the well-known charity, they were there and they said, no, 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 come over to Macedonia and help us. You've got the gift of the gab, you can chat, you're articulate, you're eloquent, you will be able to reach um, people that they're struggling to reach. Um, so what I need you to understand is 2030 is not that far away. Some people said to me, Tony, this is way, but cast your mind back to the millennium, which was 1999, 2000. We are now nearly 2022 coming to an end, going into 2023. So I'll show you how time has flown by. So 2045 is not that far away. Globally or worldwide, diabetes is responsible for one death every eight seconds. I want you to just take a stock of that. Every eight seconds in the world, somebody dies from this medical condition. And in 2021, in, in the, um, the International Diabetes Federation said 6.7 million people died from diabetes complications last year alone. I know we've had coronavirus and COVID-19. I'm not so sure the figures overall come up to that, like those figures for last year for diabetes. This is a very, very serious medical condition 
which we need to get the message out there for. That figure is wrong. It says 5 million. It is closer to 6 million of the 65 million people who live in the United Kingdom who have diabetes. But this is the alarming thing. There is about one in every 15 million people who are walking around with type 2 diabetes and do not even know they have it. Ladies and gentlemen, I would say the same. I wouldn't say the figure here is one in 15. I don't know the figures. But what I'm saying to you here in Barbados is you need to go annually and get your health checks done. I'm going to make a comparison here. Some of us drive a Volvo, a Porsche, a Benz, a BMW, or, or a um, Fiat Panda, or what have you, or Cortina, Ford Motor Car. We tend to go and get our car service, make sure the brakes are right, the gear is right, it has enough water in it, the tire pressure is right. I'm saying to you, gentle people listening, your body, given to you by Jah, Jehovah, Allah, whoever you worship, is far more important than that piece of junk or that piece of metal that you're driving around the island of Barbados. I am begging and beseeching, I am imploring you. If you get one message from this, you must go and get your health checks done at the health clinic, at your doctor or what have you. Do not sit there suffering and in silence. And what you do, grab the men in your life, whether it be your uncle, your spouse, your husband, your grandfather, or your nephew, grab them kicking and screaming because they're the ones who tend to be so macho, so manly and suffer in silence. And then had they gone earlier to have their health checks done, like going to um, the diabetes center where Dr. Dan Braffitt is in charge, the pre-diabetes and the borderline, they could have had done something about it. So I'm urging you, focus on the men, but don't leave out the women in that regard, okay? That just shows how the figure jumped from 1998 in Britain from 1.4 million to 3.8 million in 2018. And now we're here in 2022 and it's 5 million closer to 6 million, okay? 90% of people with diabetes have type two. Please remember that. 90% of people with diabetes have type two, not just in Britain, but worldwide. 8% of people have type one. And I'm gonna explain the difference between type one and type two. Then there's another 2%, which brings it up to 100%, who have rarer types of diabetes. But remember, I said my health disclaimer, I can't speak about those because I'm not a healthcare professional, okay? This shows the wards. You won't be able to see them, but this shows the wards in Birmingham where diabetes is rampant. I'll name some of them. Aston, Nietzsche's, Lazelle's, Sparkill's, Sparkbook, Small Heath. When you go to those wards in Birmingham, and I'm gonna make a comparison probably a bit to here, they're what we call inner city areas or impoverished or deprived areas. And ladies and gentlemen, every second or third shop you pass in those areas is a fast food takeaway or what we in Britain call junk food. And I've noticed the same, I'm not gonna mention any of the, the fast foods or takeaways over here, there are several. And I'm saying to you loud and clear, just like how I learned to cook back in 2008, based on the present Christmas present my daughter gave to me that Christmas. You have got to go back to basics. You've got to go back to learning to cook, getting the youngsters to cook and so on, so that they are doing, not knowing how much salt they're putting in the pot, how much sugar, how much oil and so on. We have got to have this stopping all of this fast food um, takeaway and junk food. And as a tip, I would say, those of you who work, I know this is a retired um, Barbados Association of Retired Persons, but you might have people who still work and have relatives who work. Prepare enough dishes on the weekend and put them in the fridge or freezer. So when you come home tired in the week, you have them, all you do is heat them up. Please, I'm begging you, there is way too much junk food, carbohydrates and starchy food and oils and so on that we are consuming, which is doing our health no good. I'll move swiftly on. Diabetes is serious, very, very serious. It affects every part of the body. Every single week in Britain. Now you notice that didn't say every quarter or every fortnight or every three months. Every single week in Britain, 500 people die prematurely or what would say gone too soon from this medical condition, diabetes. There are, and that figure is wrong, it's nearly closer to nearly 200 amputations, chopping off of toes and feet and limbs 
happen in Britain every single week from diabetes. No other condition we're talking about, just diabetes. 680, that's closer to 700 now, strokes happen because of diabetes in the United Kingdom, okay? 550 heart attacks and 2,000 cases of heart failure happen in the United Kingdom linked to diabetes. Diabetes is also the leading cause of preventable sight loss in people of working age in the United Kingdom. Now I'm gonna focus on this very, very clearly. I was in Dominica four years ago. Dominica has the highest rate of blindness in the whole of the Caribbean from diabetes. And what it is, just like in Britain, you have people in their 50s, 60s, 70s who are not seeing the small print properly and they're squinting and they can't see the images on the television or can't make out their friends. And they seem to think because they're 50, 60, 70, it's to do with old age. I beg you, ladies and gentlemen, it is nothing to do with old age. It is the diabetes, which you either don't know you have or you're not taking a proper eye care, having its wicked way at the back of the eyes, causing you to have blurred vision and to eventually go blind. So in Dominica, a lot of opticians and so on came over to Britain to the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and have now learned to detect. We have to have something called diabetes eye screening. I have to go and get my eyes checked every single year, although I don't wear glasses. And that's why a lot of people said to me, Tony, you know, it's when I went to the optician. The optician said, I don't like what I see forming at the back of your eyes. Please go and see your doctor and get a blood test. And some said to me, it proved that they had diabetes. Someone is diagnosed with diabetes every two minutes in the United Kingdom. That in itself is a very worrying statistic. It's expensive. Dr. Dan Brathwaite or Marilyn Bryce Bourne might have won the lotto, the Barbados version of the lotto or lottery, lottery 10 million Barbadian dollars. Notice ladies and gentlemen, that doesn't say 10 million, it says about 10 billion pounds is spent by the National Health Service on this one medical condition. There are some countries in the Commonwealth which do not have that amount of money as their gross domestic product. And here we are in Britain spending 10 billion pounds on just diabetes alone, which is about 1 million pounds an hour or one tenth of the whole of the National Health Service budget. Now I'm going to catch my breath while you listen to a two minute video. There are two main types of diabetes, type one and type two. They're different conditions, but they're both serious. There are some other rarer types of diabetes too. What all types of diabetes have in common is that they cause people to have too much glucose in their blood. But we all need some glucose. It's what gives us our energy. We get glucose when our bodies break down the carbohydrates that we eat or drink and that glucose is released into our blood. We also need a hormone called insulin. It's made by our pancreas and it's insulin that allows the glucose in our blood to enter our cells and fuel our bodies. If you don't have diabetes, your pancreas senses when glucose has entered your bloodstream and releases the right amount of insulin so the glucose can get into your cells. But if you have diabetes, this system doesn't work. When you've got type 1 diabetes, you can't make any insulin at all. If you've got type 2 diabetes, it's a bit different. The insulin you make either can't work effectively or you can't produce enough of it. In both types of diabetes, because glucose can't get into your cells, it begins to build up in your blood. And too much glucose in your blood causes a lot of different problems. To begin with, it leads to diabetes symptoms, like having to wee a lot, being incredibly thirsty, and feeling very tired. You may also lose weight, get infections like thrush, or suffer from slow healing wounds. Over a long period of time, high glucose levels in your blood can seriously damage your heart, your eyes, your feet, and your kidneys. These are known as the complications of diabetes. But with the right treatment and care, people can live a healthy life and there's much less risk that someone will experience these complications. If you've got diabetes, you can find lots of information and support about living with it using our website and helpline. As well as campaigning for everyone with diabetes to get the right care, 
Diabetes UK fund research into all types of diabetes so we can develop new treatments and one day find a cure. One day find a cure. You can find out more about type 1 and type 2 diabetes and how they're treated in our next videos. Before I go to the next video, I'm urging you please write down, go to the Diabetes UK, UK stands for United Kingdom, go to the Diabetes UK website, that video is permanently there. It's only two minutes. Show your friends, your relatives, your colleagues, your, 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 your neighbors, what is diabetes. It really encapsulates it in a very, very succinct, very, very clear way. But what I'm going to do now is just go through, recap what it is saying. I'm going to name you four people who have type 1 diabetes. And remember, type 1 is when, for no reasons known to any healthcare professional up to this day, type one is when the pancreas, and I'll stand up a six inch gland, the pancreas, which is situated from the navel string or belly button, going that way, it makes the hormone insulin, type one. When the pancreas stops working altogether, nothing to do with age, ethnicity, gender, or size, Paxin doesn't work, that is type one. You can live without an arm, you can live without any hair on your head, you can live without any teeth, you cannot live without insulin. So everybody with type 1 has to inject insulin into their stomach area three times a day. Some people prefer to have an insulin pump strapped to their body, which drips the insulin to keep them alive. That's type 1. But remember, it's only 8% of people have, 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 have type 1. We give God thanks and praise and credit, 101 years ago on the 14th of November just gone, which is World Diabetes Day, Sir Frederick Banting at his homestead in Canada and his French student Charles Best noticed a meagre dog outside. We in the cabin, let's say maga dog. They made up this concoction, just like how Alexander Fleming discovered penicillin, Sir Frederick Banting with his French medical student they discovered insulin, man-made insulin. I'm afraid it's not called woman-made insulin. It was made by two men. They injected the in insulin, which is artificial or synthetic insulin, into the dog 101 years ago and noticed the dog started to make a, a remarkable recovery. That was how insulin was discovered. Of course, with the passing of time, it's been better produced and so on. So type one have to inject. There's no escaping or else they will die. Type two, as was said in the two minute video, some insulin is being produced, but it's neither not enough or it's not doing its job properly. And I'll come on into a minute to show issues wh why that is so. In some cases, as in mine, it's hereditary. I'm gonna mention four people to you and you should know some of them who have type one diabetes. I'll start off with Theresa May, who was once Prime Minister of Britain, her pancreas is packed in all together, so she has to inject insulin to keep alive. Number two I'll mention is a black, known, black American actress known as Halle Berry. She too has type 1 diabetes. Another person I'll mention is the person who does the voiceover in that um, two-minute thing you watch. He's um, Philip Schofield. He has type 1. And the last person is Sir Stephen Redgrave, who won five Olympic gold medals on the trot in four, five successful Olympics, he also has type one, so he has to inject, but yet still he did rowing, okay? Having said that, type two, that's where we focus on, 90% of the people who have um, diabetes have type two, and that's the one that I am focusing on, and we also need to focus on. We can't do, some people with type two also get to a stage where they have to inject insulin. Let's not forget that. Some have to go on tablets to help their pancreas produce insulin. And that's one of the famous ones is metformin. There's some others on the market. I am the one who is able to, because of my physical activity and diet, not be on any medication at all. And as was said earlier, there is no known cure for diabetes. So I don't want a single one of you sending off any, any money to a fake, false, phony website to get tablets and pills. How you know what's in the tablets and pills? Might be horse manure, cow dung, grass, do not. Just go to the tried and tested 
um, websites like um, the Barbados Diabetes Association website with Dr. Dan Braffway or go to the Diabetes UK website. Those are the tried and tested ones you need to go to. I hope I'm making that crystal clear, okay? So age is a factor. The older you get, and you within the retired, um, see, if you're leading a sedentary couch potato lifestyle, sitting on your proverbial, um, you know what I'm talking on your bottom for a lot of time and not doing any physical activity. Movement, you need to get up and move, move. I'll tell you in a minute what I do. So age is a factor, family history, which you heard I have, ethnicity, as black people, we're more prone, and I'll show you a slide in a minute. Weight is a factor, but waist circumference, and some of the issues, which come about from diabetes. Some men have so much blood glucose or blood sugar, when they're trying to make love to their partner, the blood glucose or blood sugar causes them to have erectile dysfunction. Basically, they cannot have an erection. The penis flops. So that's an issue for some men. Of course, we know of heart attacks. We spoke about that stroke, high blood pressure. And of course, that's, that's something we know black people on the whole suffer from quite a lot, high blood pressure, but high cholesterol. And I'll give you one tip for high cholesterol, if you have it, oats porridge. The more oats porridge you have in the morning to fill you up. And I'm not necessarily talking about the Quaker oats and the Fosca oats, because those are more refined. Go to the specialist shops where you get the rolled oats. It's much better for you, and it's, it's far better in your system. Gestational diabetes, some of you on this might know that. There might be nurses and doctors on this, on this webinar. That is during pregnancy. Some women during their pregnancy develop this condition. It's not type one, it's not type two, it's actually called gestational diabetes and happens during the gestation period. Once they've had the baby or babies, it disappears. But what it is saying to that mother is she is at risk later in life of developing type two diabetes as are the offspring or the children she's had. Now, impaired glucose regulation, when I go to these big events back in Birmingham or London or wherever, Coventry, Manchester, some doctors like to use that to explain. And I say to them, speak the language of the people. Can you imagine me going into a community and telling them about impaired glucose regulation? I'll put it there so that you can know what it means. It means if your doctor says that to you, you're on the border of getting diabetes. So your borderline or your pre-diabetes. The word pre, the prefix pre means before. And if you get told you're pre or borderline, I'm begging you, make the lifestyle changes to prevent yourself getting the diabetes. Because once you get it, try and get out rid of it. Some people lead such a rigid life that they're able to reverse it or it goes into remission. It does not mean that they have been cured. If they go back to the bad eating habits and not doing any physical activity, the diabetes will come back. So there's no known cure for it up to this day. All right, steroid induced diabetes. Some people for various diseases have to go on medication, steroid. Some mild steroid, some very strong steroid, and some are on steroids probably for the rest of their life. However, some people, and I have three friends in Britain who don't have type one, they don't have type two, they never had gestational diabetes, they have steroid-induced diabetes. Because they were on steroids, and I'm not saying anybody on this, on this webinar must suddenly just give up steroids if you're on it. It has to be done properly through your doctor. But these three people were on steroids for various diseases. And what happened, the steroids affected the pancreas and they ended up with steroid-induced diabetes. The same also applies to bodybuilders, men and women, who instead of trying to build up their muscles and biceps and triceps the normal way, some want to do it quickly and they actually inject steroids into their body. Bodybuilders, men and women, they are at risk of getting steroid induced diabetes. So if you have any relatives out there who you notice doing that, or you notice one day they like this and next day they like the Incredible Hulk, you need to ask them what on earth are they doing and advise them not to use steroids. Uh, ethnicity, people from African, Caribbean, and South Asian backgrounds are two to four times more likely to develop type 2 diabetes than white people. I'm not saying this, this is fact. We start getting it, and some of you have children and grandchildren and nieces and nephews, we start getting type 2 diabetes from age 25. 
white people start getting it 15 years later at age 40. It is to do, people ask me, Tony, why? To do with our genetics, our DNA, our metabolism, any of those words, to do with our genes. And you in Barbados must know of Sir Professor Hilary Beckles, the Vice Chancellor of the University of the West Indies. Go on YouTube. He has a lovely YouTube um, post there where he explains our forefathers, for mothers and forefathers, came on the slave ships from the west coast of Africa 300 years ago. And the Bakra, the master, sitting on his veranda having fresh fish with his salad and so on. We were fed salt beef, salt pork, herring, salt mackerel, salt fish. It was hot in Barbados, Jamaica, Canada, uh, um, 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 Trinidad and those places. It was very hot. That has passed down in our DNA from 300 years ago. And I was in Jamaica recently and they took me out for stew peas and rice. And the stew peas and rice was so salt. I said, excuse me, why is this so salty? They said, that's why we love it. I said, you're, you're, you're storing up a problem for high blood pressure and hypertension. You're also storing up a problem for getting diabetes. We have got to change our eating habits, cut down on this amount of salt we're eating and the amount of sugar and the carbohydrates and so on. So that's why it's in our DNA, passing down and we're passing it down to our children and grandchildren. Environmental factors play a point, part as well, overcrowding. If you live in an overcrowded place, stress. If you're in a stressful relationship or stressed at work or in Britain where we have things like racism and it impacts on us as black people, if you don't know how to get rid of that stress in terms of to calm your nerves, it can affect your pancreas, believe it or not, and cause diabetes to, to be triggered because of the stress and the racism. Not to mention the poor diet and of course the couch potato sedentary lifestyle, okay? Now I'm gonna tell you, um, um, this I, I show all the time. Some of you might remember the Miss Barbados or the Miss World or the Miss Jamaica contestants walking down the catwalk with an hourglass figure. 36 bust, 24 inch waist and a 36 inch hip. Show me a woman nowadays with a 24 inch waist. And you notice it says not from the trouser size. This is the score, ladies and gentlemen. I know some women have had children. Some women are just bigger in size. Diabetes UK, if you go to their website, it says all women, no discrimination, all women should aim for a waist size from the belly button or navel string of 31 and a half inches. Realistically, some of you might be 42 or 44. You're not gonna get down to 31 and a half, let's be real. But I want you to come down from 44 to about 42 then 40, because what you're then doing is moving the fat around here that six inch gland that's making all of this insulin you if you have too much fat here you're preventing the pancreas from what it should do naturally i'm begging you will also a bit overweight and a bit fat you try to lose some of that puppy fat around, around there asian men that's indian pakistani and bangladeshi men they are allowed because they are more prone to getting diabetes as was shown in the ten, top 10 five were asian countries they are allowed from the belly button again, 35 inches is what they should aim for. But let's say the man is 44 inches. He ain't gonna get down to 35. We're being realistic. You say, okay, let's put you on a program or let you eat better and do more physical activity. Bring yourself down from 44 to probably 40. You will enable the pancreas to do its job more properly. White people and black people are allowed two extra inches, which is 37 inches and the same applies. You will see something called tofi, thin on the outside, fat on the inside. Basically, simply put, there are some people who are as skinny as a rake, that's where it comes in. The fat is deposited in the liver and actually around the pancreas. So if you see a thin person, a meager person, and the person says to you, they have diabetes, don't dispute them, don't tell them, say no, it's only fat people can get it because thin people can as well, okay? So going to the toilet a lot, extreme thirst. Some people have trush and genital issue, itching, I should say, genital itching in their private parts. Some people have slow healing of cuts and wounds, which I'll come back to. Blurred vision, which I mentioned, Dominica has the highest amount of blindness. In Barbados, with your 99% literacy rate, which I applaud you for, the issue here is 
chopping off of toes and feet, lower limb amputations. Barbados is top of the league in the Caribbean for foot loss, toes and feet. You've got to make sure you do something about it. And for starters, even on the lovely beaches you have here, do not walk around barefoot. Those of you who think, oh yes, I can walk down on, the, on barefoot on the grass the, or the lawn or this, or even in your home on the carpet, I'm urging you, wear slippers or sandals or something on your feet. Because I have to go and get my feet checked every year and they check the nerve endings to make sure I'm having feelings and sensation. Because if the marker, the pin, the needle, the rusty nail, the thumbtack goes in your foot, it can stay in there and fester, which is why I'm gonna talk about um, slowing up cuts and wounds, a true story. A chap in Birmingham ended up in the hospital in Birmingham and I went to look for him. And this is a true story. A uh, glass fell at his home and he brushed it up in a dustpan and brush with his son. However, a splinter went into his big toe. Ladies and gentlemen, typical man, because this is a man's thing, they're at home trying to get it better with dental and antiseptic. Instead, it got worse. A friend visited him and said, I don't like the smell of your toe. Go to the deep GP doctor. He went, the doctor took one look at him, sent him to the hospital. Gangrene or septicemia had set into that big toe. They chopped off his big toe. This is a true story. I'm not telling you no lie. The gangrene or septicemia had spread to the other four toes. They chopped off those. It had spread to just below the knee. They chopped off his knee. And what I should have told you that this is a man who was macho into the bodybuilding and every Arnold Schwarzenegger, every muscle and sinew. So during the summer months, he would wear the shorts and the woman would look and admire all his physique and so on. You know what set in? A consequence of his um, uh, leg chopped off and having to wear a prosthetic limb. Depression set in. Depression, mental health. He drew all the curtains and he wouldn't leave his home. And I used to have to ring him and say, you've lost a limb you have not lost your life. Try and get over it, which he has. Then, of course, there's extreme tiredness and weight loss. And then sometimes, and this is what I want you to bear in mind, sometimes there are no symptoms. No tired, no toilet, no thirsty, no thinner, no blurred vision. And by the time you find out, because you have not been going regularly once a year for your health checks, which I'm urging you to do, and by the time the doctor finds out, your, your organs have been damaged. And you hear that you have to go on kidney dialysis or you're going to go blind, or you're going to have a heart attack or a stroke. I am urging you, gentle people, sometimes there are no symptoms at all. So eye disease is one issue. Heart disease is another issue. Kidney disease is another issue, nerve disease. I went on a program. The um, BBC television celebrated the 70th anniversary of the National Health Service a few years ago. And they asked moi, me to go on this program. And the first question the woman asked me, she said, so, Mr. Kelly, you're a diabetes sufferer. And I just said straight away, looked her right in the eye and said, excuse me, never ever call me a diabetes sufferer. I am living with this medical condition, which is hereditary. I am managing and controlling it. It is not managing or controlling me. I accept that there are people out there who suffer from this condition. And I saw firsthand in Jamaica, in Whitehall, the country area, those experiences. But as God, as long as I live and God give me strength, I am not going to go there. This is what um, I'm gonna tell you that I do. Before I tell you what I do, even if you can't get to go to your GP, take a picture of this. It's a Diabetes UK Know Your Risk tool. You go on there, just like how you're gonna look at the two minute video, this is on there. You put in your height, your age, your gender, your weight, you add all the information it asks you for, you put it in and your ethnicity and it can work out for you. Over one million, well, and a half million people have done it. No risk. These are people who don't, don't know whether they have it or not. No risk, N-O, low risk, L-O-W risk, medium or high. Now, if you're back in Britain, it will then signpost you over the last five years or so, we have the National Diabetes Prevention Program for people who are pre-diabetes or borderline Having found out, they either have been referred by their GP or they go on this and then are signposted to go to about nine months of slow cl classes with others in the same position to look at weight management, to look at food and all these sorts of things. Now, be more active. I'll tell you the things that I do. 
you don't have to do the things that I do. And remember, so far I have not used the word exercise. I used it once some years ago and an elderly woman, disabled woman said, Mr. Kelly, you expect me as a disabled woman to go to the gym? Exercise conjures up images you want the person to go to the gym. That's not what I'm asking you to do. However, this is what I do. I go for years, I go to a Pilates class. I go to a yoga class. Yoga helps me to relax because all of the racism that um, is in Britain and so on, and you know it is a, can be a cause of triggering of that. So I go to Pilates, I go to yoga. I do badminton with my cousin every week. I go to an aquaerobics class. Couldn't swim, but you go in the water and the instructor is there and 20, 30 of you are going against the flow of the water with your hands and your feet. It's one of the best classes to go to. I also, apart from that, go to a Zumba class. I'm, I'm, a lot of women laugh at me when I say Zumba. Sometimes I'm the one dege dege man, or probably two of us, in a Zumba class with 20, 26, 28 women. And I say, I am the rose amongst you thorn. I am there for a purpose. Movement, movement. I want my heart muscles to go wrong, to circulate the blood so that I'm not eating or what have you or drinking and then the blood glucose and blood sugar just remains in the system. I want to dissipate it, to get rid of it. And it's only by doing physical activity that you can do that. Then three years ago, I heard that Linford, I read an article that Linford Christie, Jamaican runner who runs for Britain, learned to swim. And I thought, my grandmother, I was her favorite grandson. She said, you can't go catch crab, you can't go to the river, you can't go to the beach. So I have never learned to swim. I thought, well, if it's good enough for Linford Christie, at my age, it's still good enough for me. So I registered that where I did my master's degree at Birmingham University, they have a big pool there, and I started to learn to swim as a beginner. Three months ago, I was moved from the beginner's class to the intermediary class. So I'm expecting in about another six months, I'll go up to the advanced. This myth of black people can't swim, we need to get rid of it. You're surrounded by the Caribbean Sea. Every part you go in a Barbados, the sea surrounds you. Same way in Jamaica as well. You either need to learn to swim or if it's too late for yourself, get your children and your grandchildren. Our daughter, we taught her from age three. Arm bands and she got to swimming classes and she's a competent swimmer. Swimming is one of the best forms of physical activity that you can do because you're using up all the muscles and, and, and sinews and so on in your body. If you don't fancy that, line dancing. You can do climbing the stairs instead of taking the lift. You can do mowing the lawn. You can do cutting the grass. You can do cleaning the windows. Find something. And all these kids that you have on the, the PlayStation and the Game Boy and the tablet and the iPad and so on, I am begging you, now give them that for Christmas. Give them things that will have them outside. But in Britain, we don't get a lot of sunlight. So people have to top up with, with vitamin D tablets. Here I am topping up with vitamin D tablets. So when I go with vitamin D sun, the natural sun, beg your pardon. So when I go back, I won't have, well, I've never taken vitamin D tablets. I know some people swear by it because we don't get enough sun to, to enable us back in, in, in somewhere like Britain. But going back to the tablets and the iPhone, let them go play marbles, hopscotch, cricket, rounders, football, get them out in the fresh air, make them walk up and down on the lovely beaches. But remember, as I said, not without something on their feet. Eat a healthy, balanced diet. And if you're a smoker, um, stop smoking. Um, but it's important. I don't want people to go on diets. Like some people say, I'll go on a keto diet or I'll go on a water diet or this diet. Just have a healthy, well-balanced diet and cut down on the amount of carbohydrates you're eating. I'm talking the rice, the bread, the patty, um, the pasta. Those are all carbohydrates. And if you don't learn anything from this session today, all carbohydrates break down into your body into glucose or sugar. Some people get the view, oh, I'm gonna cut down on sugar. And they say condensed milk and, um, and donuts and, and the Christmas cake and the bun. To a certain extent, yes. And as, as, for, as for fruit drinks, you see, when you're giving Tommy or Jane or Sue some fruit drinks, which is packed with sugar, when they're not looking, dilute it. I beg you dilute it because if you keep on giving them this, this sweet sugar, this sweet drink, they will, it will become an acquired taste. Please, I'm asking you, 
and, and go for more fruits um, sort of thing and vegetables in your diet. Fruits and vegetables, that's what I eat a lot. Um, I don't know if I have time to sh sh show this, do I? Tell me, please. About four slides after this. Hello? Five more minutes, please. How many? Five. Five more minutes. Okay. I'll quickly touch on two of these. HbA1c or what you hear called A1c. Blood glucose. You can't fool any doctor or nurse when they take your bloods. They can tell what you've ate or drank for three months. Because I have the sickle cell trait, not the full-blown sickle cell anemia, just the trait, if my wife had been born with the sickle cell trait, the chances are our daughter would have developed the full-blown sickle cell anemia. But because I have the trait only, I can't do A1C. I have to do a different test when I go for my bloods each year for diabetes, and it's called the fructosamine test. It can only tell me what I've ate or drank, the fructosamine test, for the last two weeks. There are more black people with either the sickle cell, the sickle cell trait, or another condition called thalassemia who cannot do HbA1c. So you need to make sure you're doing the right thing when your doctor sends. The other one I'll mention is pernicious anemia. Few years ago, what I wouldn't have done years ago, but few years ago, I was feeling very tired. So of course I go down to my doctor. The doctor did some bloods and sent them off. And it came back saying, you have pernicious anemia. Big words. Simply put, you're lacking in vitamin B12. And you know who will have big pernicious anemia? Vegans and vegetarians who do not eat meat have to take vitamin B12 tablets because most vitamin B12 comes from animals. I eat meat products, but and I also eat some, um, some go and look up which other um, fruits have vitamin B12. So I said to the doctor, how are we going to deal with this? This is the truth, ladies and gentlemen. Every three months for the rest of my life, when this was diagnosed so many years ago, I must have a B12 injection in my bottom till I die. I said to the doctor, you better wheel and turn and come again. That is not happening. So I have a lot of doctors and nurses in my family. And I went to the Pernicious Anemia Society website and older people, especially in the retired Barbados Association of Retired Persons, a lot of you might be lacking in vitamin B12. Older people have this condition. I take Floridix, F-L-O-R-A-D-I-X. It's a tonic. My wife prefers Metatone. It's also a tonic. We take those and that helps to increase your vitamin B12. I did that and I've gone back to the doctor and everything has been fine ever since. I'll briefly mention kidney stones because I used to like milk. The more cream on the top of the milk, the cow's milk, the better. One day I was having, this is going back probably about 14 years ago. I was having almighty pain in bed. And my, I said to my wife, my appendix has burst. Now women are very bright. She said to me, Tony, don't be silly. Your appendix hasn't burst. Your appendix is not on that side. It's on the other side. And I said, well, I don't know. I'm in pain. I had to be rushed to the hospital. I formed kidney stones because I used to love cow's milk with the more cream on the top, calcium form and the calcium form kidney stones. Ladies and gentlemen, my mother told me off and the doctor told me off and said, if you don't want to come back into hospital, change your milk routine. Do not drink cow's milk. Cow's milk is for the formation of teeth and bones in babies and young children. So I have this in there, almond milk, rice milk, cashew milk, um, which other one? Coconut milk and oat milk. These are all plant-based milks. Those are the ones we as adults, and those of you who have condensed milk in your house, throw away the condensed milk. You shouldn't be having condensed milk full stop, period. Okay, moving swiftly on. Eat a healthy balance diet, coming to the end, be more active. So people in London or people in the whole of Britain, taxi drivers, bus drivers, van drivers, tube drivers, lorry drivers, they are the people who have diabetes the most because they are sitting down, sedentary couch potato, couch lifestyle all day. They come home, the television is watching them, more than they're falling asleep in front of the television. They go up to bed and the routine starts again. They don't do any physical activity. So you need to be mindful of that. Form a walking club with three, four of you and go walking. Encourage and enable your friends to walk, um, what have you. 
social prescribing. It's something which is in Britain a lot now. Instead of going down the big pharma route where everything the doctors prescribe medication, there are some people who will have to be on medication. Let's not kid ourselves. But there are others, the doctors are now saying, well, instead of giving you medication, I'm going to prescribe for you Zumba classes, swimming classes, um, a class of gym, out of the GP's budget. Note that, not out of your budget. You come back and see me in three months time and let me see what, how you've toned up and let me see what your cholesterol is like and let me see what your blood pressure is like and let me see if you've reduced your, um, your glucose blood levels. That's what's in, in vogue in Britain now at the moment, social prescribing. This guy in Jamaica, he swears by smoothies. Coming to an end, smoothies. So you have the kale, the kalalo, the spinach, the, um, or all these lovely vegetable smoothies. And then some people go for the fruit smoothies. I'll demonstrate. When you eat an apple or kale or carrot or so on, you chew it in your mouth, it goes into a bolus, B-O-L-U-S, or ball. The enzymes in the stomach, in the beggy pardon, in the mouth, the saliva, do what they have to do. It goes down in here, and the enzymes there, whether it be the peptic acids or the amino acids, do what they're supposed to do the natural way and dissipate everything around the body. If you have a smoothie, I'll demonstrate. This is water, but this is a smoothie. It goes down, the, stuff, the, 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 the mouth hasn't had anything to do. The stomach hasn't had a chance to do anything. You either pass it out there in the front or at the back. Smoothies, I'm telling you gentle folk, should be no more than three or four times a year. I'm being deadly serious when I say that. And as for the ones in the supermarket, they are packed with sugar. Take a picture of that if you wish. Those are the websites I would urge you to go to. And if you have any friends in England, especially if they're Asian, I have to tell the Asian community, the Bangladeshi, the Indians, and the Pakistans, Pakistani people, when they go to the website, don't think that it's only people in English who are there. They can get a translator, interpreter for Mapuru, Hindu, Gujarati, Arabic, Chinese. So those are the websites that we like to use. They are the tried and tested proper websites, not the fake false phony ones. And that's the end. Thank you very much. Um, Diane, we, Diane, we we want to take some questions and answers, and Diane will um, lead off that segment. Diane, are you still connected, Doctor D? Sherilyn, are you seeing Diane? Yes, please. She is still here. I just answered her on mute. Okay, fine. So Diane will lead this segment with the Q and A. Thank you very much, Tony. I'm certain that there are quite a few questions. But Dr. D would lead that ses segment off. Remember, if there are any questions, you need to use the raise hand reaction or place your questions in the chat. And Dr. Diane Brathwaite will call on you. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, sorry about that. Can you hear me well? Yes, very well. Okay, thank you. Um, so yes, Tony, thank you very much um, for that presentation. I think each time you do your presentations, I get something new or I have a new impression. <laughs> um, so I'm not gonna start with, a, I'm gonna start with a comment, not, not so much a question. I like that you pointed out that if you have prediabetes, right? That's the opportune moment to actually put this condition into remission. And I want to encourage people there. Um, what a lot of research is showing now is that if you control things like prediabetes and diabetes very well from the beginning of your diagnosis, you can go for many years without having a decline in your diabetes and you may never need insulin at all. 
what happens is that when your blood sugars are not controlled, your pancreatic function declines more rapidly over time. And so I think we're trying to get more people in Barbados to understand this. You need to control things from the get go. Don't wait five years after a diagnosis to think, you know, well, I need to have my blood sugars controlled or don't wait until you have a complication um, to do that. Um, I also love that Mr. Kelly, um, although I fit into the BARP age population now, you definitely fit into it. <laughs> And I want to just um, encourage everybody out here that there is something that everybody can do to keep physically active. It might be that walking on the road may not suit you, but maybe being in the sea and swimming or moving about in the ocean does. Maybe you prefer gardening or going to some ballroom classes or line dancing. I'm going to make one confession on, on the part of my family. My mother was diagnosed with diabetes when she was about 65 or 66. And she started doing line dancing. Within four months, my mother was taken off of medication. She was told she was no longer diabetic. She is now actually slimmer than me. My mother is now 75 and she still does her line dancing. Probably I'm going with her next week to three, line dancing. Three days, three days a week. So I always use that as a testimony to the fact that, you know, anybody can benefit from um, physical activity. And as she told me, she always said when she started the line dancing, she had two left feet. OK, she's now at an advanced level. And she teaches and, you know, I just want to encourage everybody to just, you know, um, to, to take up that physical activity and mind the diet as well. Um, a lot of the foods we buy in the supermarket are filled with firstly with a lot of things we don't know, a lot of sugar, a lot of fat, a lot of salt. And I like the phrase that some one of my friends uses. She says, eat real food. <laughs> OK, yes. <laughs> yes, I have a question here, Mr. Kelly, um, and I'll let you answer this one because I believe you can. I have a question concerning breakfast cereal. I have heard that the dried food in the cereal is not good to have so early in the mornings. That it right. puts I was, I was putting the answer in the chat. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, I mentioned oats, oats, the rolled oats. There's also, at the weekends, try for cornmeal. Cornmeal is good. And even banana porridge is good as well. But in terms of cereals, we have in our home bran flakes, and we have Alpen, not the one with the whole heap of added sugar, the, the, the plain Alpen, muesli, Alpen, bran flakes. And we also go for Weetabix, and I'm sure Barbados has Weetabix, and shredded wheat. All those, which are much better than the normal corn flakes, all those are good for you. So bran flakes, um, at, 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 each person is different. So I don't know if that person has actually been to their doctor and there's an issue there or the healthcare professional. Yeah. But we, we know for a fact when in our household and the people that I speak to, the healthcare professionals, they so get, go for the browns, the bran flake, the oat flake, the uh, oat, oatmeal, the, um, the Weetabix and, and the shredded wheat. And of course, with plant-based milk, not cow's milk. Yeah, so I want to just add to that point there. So first of all, when you're having a breakfast series, when you dry the fruit, naturally you tend to use a lot more fruits. So if you had diabetes and you said, well, I'm going to have um, nine, 10 or 11 grapes. When you pour the raisin brown, you're getting four more than nine, 10 or 11 raisins. And already the cereal is already a carbohydrate. So then you're adding more sugar uh, through the excessive dried fruit. And then, as you said, if you're using cow's milk and um, we use a lot of evaporated milk in Barbados, you're then adding even more sugar into the diet. So it's like everything adds up. So it's about thinking about how you how you balance thing, things. Um, oh, so this person said that they're not diabetic, but they use it uh, most morning. mornings. No, yes, if, if you do, I would certainly encourage you just to make sure that you exercise regularly, be 100% certain that you're not pre-diabetic, mm -hmm. um, because if you were pre-diabetic, the same things would apply as if you had diabetes. Uh, you think about how you balance it differently and just use in moderation. Sometimes maybe choose another type of cereal. You pointed out quite correctly that things that are flakes because the, the natural integrity of these flaky cereals has been destroyed so much, it still can make the sugar rise. But if you're not diabetic, your body's going to handle it better than if you were someone with diabetes. I'm going to add there, Dr. Braffway, this book, World Foods, Carbs and Cows. Have it in your kitchen. 
Uh, it, it's 12 pounds 99. It's, it's endorsed by Diabetes UK. It has every page telling you fat consumption, calories, carbs, and so on, in, in terms of breakfast, meals, and dinners, and, and snacks, and so on. Invest in one of these books. It's, it's only just out in the last three to six months. And it is the definitive thing for you to use. World food, because it says here, a visual guide to African, Arabic, Caribbean, and South Asian foods for diabetes and also weight management. I urge you to try and invest and send off to Amazon or wherever and get this Carbs and Cows World book because that will actually give you a proper breakdown of portion sizes and what's fat, what's carbs and so on. I highly recommend this book to everybody on the, on the webinar. Okay, Dr. Diane, there's a Priscilla Miller. Her hand has been up for a while. Okay, I'm not seeing that. I'm so sorry. Can we, oh, yes, ask to unmute her? She can unmute herself. Ms. Miller, can you unmute yourself and, yes. Hi, good evening, thank you. <clears throat> Wonderful session, Mr. Kelly. I, I find it very interesting that the last 17 years you have not had to use your education. But a question is, how often do you take your blood sugar? No, I don't at all. I, I, I don't. I, I just no, go, just, I, I don't take, and some people have to, because of where they're at, they have to test their blood sugars and so on. And, and that's right. And that's so. So they keep in control. But mine is only my yearly visit to the diabetic nurse at the GP surgery. She so your AC, your AC1, I think that's the correct term. Your AC1 is in the correct range. Yes, it's always in the correct range. So they say, even during lockdown, when people after lockdown had to go back and see, we had a long lockdown period in Britain, and they had to go back and be weighed again and so on. My doctor said, you are the last person I was going to call because some people turned two stone, three stone. I hadn't put on a single ounce because I found hills and valleys and dales and so on to work. I kept on doing this. She said, I know you're very disciplined. You're, you're very good. So, um, no, I, I don't prick fingers at all. Not, never have done. Yes, oh, so that uh, means that that means that some days your your glucose level to be high, and you not know. Some days it could be low, and you not know. Not not necessarily because remember I do a lot of physical activity. Um, some people have hypers and hypers, whether they go low or go high. Um, mm -hmm. but because I do a lot of physical activity, and we eat sensibly in our home, we eat very very sensibly in our home. Um, my doctor says no. Don't waste your time um, pricking your finger, testing your blood or so on, because you're very disciplined, you're very focused, and I know you'll be, I've never had any dizzy spells or fainting spells or any of that sort of thing. No. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But some, some people have girl. to test. I want yeah. to come on, comment on that, Priscilla. So in the United Kingdom, persons whose diabetes is remission or controlled on tablets, they don't necessarily get issued with strips to stick because it has actually been shown by research that if you manage your lifestyle and your diet very well, your A1C is generally um, can be quite good. Now, everybody is who has diabetes is at a very different stage because of Mr. Kelly's choices. His mm -hmm. insulin resistance would actually be very low. So he's not going to probably end up getting a blood sugar of 12 or 13 from something he eats. If he became sick and his body was excessively stressed, it is possible, yes, that his blood sugars can go up. But he's actually put his diabetes into, into remission. So in his case, like my mother, is actually adequate to just check the A1C. Some people will do it every six months. In Barbados, we will do it every six months if he went into remission. And some people may just do it annually as well. So he's actually moved from, he's not, he's out of his pre-diabetic phase, he's in remission. So his body is going to handle sugar very differently from somebody who is not in remission. But that is because of the choices that he made early when his blood sugar was very high. So he's done a lot of work to get where he is now. Um, the other thing with checking your blood sugar is you want to know what information do you want from checking the blood sugar? Because there are a lot of people who check their blood sugar every single morning, but it doesn't give them the information that they need to make a difference. So in terms of checking the blood sugar, anybody who went into remission, has pre-diabetes, has diabetes, that's a discussion you need to have with your doctor as to how you check your blood sugar and your dietitian to get the information that you need that will help you to kind of stay in control. So it's very what we call individualized. Everybody's diabetes journey is very individualized, as is their management. Thank you, 
But thank you for that question. It was a great question. I just wanted to bring up one other point that I liked very much. Can everybody, can you still hear me? Yeah. Okay. And that was that you mentioned steroids. And um, as persons get older, um, they may find that they may have to have steroids, maybe for a medical condition. It could be for arthritis and they get in, you know, steroid injections or for some other reason. And what I've found in my practice is that a lot of people seem to be unaware that the steroids, if you have diabetes, will actually raise your blood sugar, or if you're pre-diabetic, it can raise your sugar. If you just use a very short course of it as tablets, it may not do that. Or if it goes on the skin, it may not do that. But when you're talking about injections that can last, you know, for several weeks in your body, it can impact your sugar. So anytime you have a treatment, uh, whether you're hypertensive or you're diabetic, always ask your doctor if it can impact, you know, on your condition. Because I have people who turn up and they're completely surprised and they don't understand why their blood sugars have gone up. But, you know, it may be that they had a steroid um, injection um, into the joint. It doesn't mean, as you said, if you have a medical condition necessitating steroids that you wouldn't use them, but you need to be aware so that you can keep an eye on your blood sugar. And if it needs to be treated, well, then you treat it. Because sometimes, of course, that medical condition might be quite serious and you may actually need the treatment. Okay, I don't think there are any more questions, are they? Okay, what I would like to say, um, of course, is a horrific, a wonderful, not horrific, sorry, it's too late at night. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Kelly, um, for turning up and showing up. And I want to thank all of the participants, everybody who's come on here tonight. I am just like totally astounded. We went yes, up to nearly 150 well. people, Marlon. Yes, okay, yes, and I think good. that's great. Really great. Really great. Good. Yes. And I want to just thank um, Barb, um, as usual, for partnering with, with us. We have a very interesting and dynamic relationship. Um, persons who have their Barb memberships get discounts on almost every single service that we have in-house uh, at the Diabetes Center. And as you know, we've been doing some eye screening at the Barb headquarters, which has also had a very good response. So we thank you for that. And I want to encourage participants to reach out to Barb and let them know what types of things you may want to see because our organization, and I'm sure other organizations are very willing to bring these things to you on a voluntary basis of no charge to you. Okay, so there are lots of organizations out there that would be happy to partner and we will continue to partner and look at new ways of partnering so we can deliver more services, more education, more support, etc. So immediately I smell our nutrition um, <laughs> meeting coming up sometime soon. Um, so thank you so much once again. I know that my manager, um, Claire, Mrs. Claire Jordan, is on the call somewhere. Uh, thank you, Claire, for turning up. I saw uh, um, Elizabeth Ferdinand. I saw my good friend, Marcia Weeks. I saw my good friend, Errol Griffith. So just thanks to you guys and everybody else who's come out to support I, I saw my good friend. Adrian Lord, who's also a BART member on as well. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, it's so great, you know, that these that everybody's kind of coming out, even the healthcare providers. And I think in Barbados, generally speaking, it's so important that we as uh, not, not, not just healthcare providers, but as people, as advocates, that we have these conversations because you are actually often a stronger influence as somebody who might be non-medical, non who is living living a story or a journey. Um, you know, that someone else is doing. So you can be a direct encouragement to your family, your friends, your peers, and wider Barbados. And honestly, with the state that diabetes is in in Barbados and NCDs, we need as much help as we can possibly get. Our numbers are just rising and rising and rising. And we need persons of all ages, the very young, the children, uh, the older people. We just need people to take control of their lives. Um, I, I think one thing. Can I just add one thing? You mentioned children. I was because some people have told me about there's a certain I can't remember the name of it, but they give the children to take to school in the, in their pack lunches. There's a certain chubby. crunchy, huh? Yeah? Begins oh, with a C. Chubby? Whatever chubby. it is, but um, give them fruits instead. That, that, that apparently, oh. I, I, and I tell you something about fruits and vegetables. Lots of people when I do this all over the world say to me, Tony, fruits and vegetables and eat near in Barbados is expensive. 
All I'd said to you is, you shouldn't be buying fruit and vegetables at the supermarket. You're paying for the ambience, the car park, the cashiers, the, the, the people who are going to take your goods to the car. There are markets around. There are vendors who are selling by the side of the road who will sell you the same products at, products at a third of the price. We don't buy those things in supermarkets. <laughs> They're way too expensive. So this idea of, of fruits and vegetables is expensive. We can't afford it. You, you need to think creatively and say, well, where can I go and support the higgler, the vendor, the person selling at the side of the road, uh, getting the same, the pear, the, the plum, the what have you. Bear that in mind too, please. And that's me done. <laughs> Yeah, so I have um, two comments. Um, so Claire did message and she just wanted to thank everybody for turning up. And that's from all of us at the Barbados Diabetes Foundation and the Maria Holder Diabetes Center for the Caribbean. We're located in Warrens. I have one last question. Are there healthy recipes available from, di from diabetic associations? Uh, yeah, most of yes. the times to get yes. recipes, they are. Yes. Diabetes UK. Are. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. So you have to just, just reach out for them. There are so many sources um, of healthy recipes. And while we say healthy recipes, kill the fruit juices, use more infused water, use natural, use, use, use natural water and natural food is far better than drinking fruit juices, which have been overly processed and will impact your sugar and actually probably have in more carbohydrate. Uh, very little fiber, and there have been a lot of the vitamins have been damaged. So fruit is far better than juice. I don't know how that popped into it, but we're talking about food. Um, so there's one other comment. Will the recording be emailed to members? Um, I will leave that at um, Marilyn Rice Bowen to answer, but I believe it's being recorded. Yes. As a matter of fact, I just checked with our EA, and she says that we will have our um, Facebook um, personnel Place it on YouTube. Okay. And embed the link to the website and share the link with person. So as soon as it's done, we we'll, not today. Let's give us today is Tuesday. Let's say by Thursday we can go on the website and it will be there. We can't email it to every member, but we'll share it on the website. The link yeah. on the website. Okay. And I just want to say that Mr. Kelly is here for a little while enjoying our beaches. So if there are any further questions, first of all, we're going to have another presentation in person. This is at the Maria Holder Diabetes Center in Warrens on Saturday. And it will almost be like a walkthrough where we'll have just like little pop-up things. Some of these medical students should be helping, assisting. And you can come and hear him again and, you know, hopefully get like some nutrition tips, foot screening tips. So we're just having a small open house. If you want to come and talk to anybody in person, uh, I'll be there and we'll answer any questions. Should you have any other questions that pop up that haven't been answered? You can either send them to our website. You can send them to Marilyn, who has a fast for me anyway. Um, I, I'm, I'm easy to find. You'll find me somehow or I'm at the Diabetes Center. 4170305. We'll be there between nine o'clock and 12 o'clock on Saturday morning. It's just an informal um, thing, but people can, can kind of walk through. And I'm saving Mr. Kelly for the last um, session, which will be say about 11.20 to about 12 or so. Okay. For the radio station tomorrow, the radio station. Yeah, well, what happened? The, unfortunately, the radio station has been put back, but they've asked okay. us if we can come on the radio station to wrap up the diabetes segments okay. on not this Friday, but next Friday. So I said that we will come, we'll, we'll talk to her and see if we're able to facilitate that. It will be myself, Mr. Kelly, and we'll also have a podiatrist on. And this is with Kimberly Skeet. And this is 100.7. And we'll be talking foot care, wound care, um, all of those types of things. Foot screening tips. Um, once I'm there, you can ask me anything. You'll be getting all of that. Yes. Foot screening tips, footwear, um, just, you know, little um, pieces of advice. We'll be doing that. We won't be doing actual full foot screening, but we'll be there to give you advice on things. Doc, Dr. D, before you go, um, tomorrow is Wednesday and we'll have a nice screening clinic at bar. I don't know if you would want to bring Tony through. If, if he has time to pass through, depends. Well, since, actually, yes, yeah, since the um the radio is no longer on tomorrow, you can you he can go to the ice screening um clinic. So mm -hmm. yeah, my by all means. Okay. I'll probably give you a drop down. Okay. okay. Okay, also Tony has put his email there and I'm gonna put my email there. So if you have any queries, you can just send them, okay? Yeah, okay, fine. Thank you so much, Marilyn, and thanks to everybody again.
you're most welcome. And the task, the, the task that has been assigned to our interim CEO, Dr. Glenda Jilts, to move the board to sign. Dr. Jilts. Good evening, everyone. And I must say on behalf of BARP and its members, a special thank you to Mr. Kelly for that very provocative discussion. Uh, and you know we hear about NCDs every day, um, the triple threat of diabetes, hypertension, and high cholesterol. But I think you've given us some, some tips. I didn't know about the four T's, tired, toilet, um, thinning, and thirsty. So certainly I will, I will embrace that. And also um, reinforcing the importance of good nutrition, um, not dieting, as that is a kind of a, a fad, but really trying to take advantage of what we have here on our local fruits and vegetables. So I wanna thank you very much for taking the time out to talk to us. And of course, our friends at the Diabetes, Barbados Diabetes Foundation, Claire Jordan and Dr. Diane Brathwick for partnering, partnering with BARP and bring this session to you. Thank you for those who came on stream. We had over 150 people, and I know we have more persons who wanted to be on at a later time. So certainly we will have this um, clip on our website um, for those persons who could not make this session this evening. Thank you once again. Do appreciate all of you. Stay healthy, stay safe. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.